And for more, we're joined by Dr. Sean E., a clinical psychologist and a psychoanalytic a psychotherapist. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, firstly, how difficult is it to distinguish between normal stress, distress, and mental illness? And have the sources of pressure on young people evolved? So I would say that um, stress is something that um, can be quite beneficial to us, and it helps us be able to uh, operate at an optimal capacity. Um, too little, it might not motivate us sufficiently, but too much, it then causes us to lose track and lose focus. So what I would say about this is that stress is what we experience um, overall, what we call load on the entire system, psychologically speaking. So when it becomes kind of overwhelming for us, then that becomes a bit more distressing for us, where we find a sense of discomfort and um, almost approaching a traumatic response, such as what happened in the school. Yeah. Dr. E, tackling mental health issues is being seen as a whole of community effort. Everyone plays some part. What do you see as the key gaps to this and, and how can those gaps be addressed? I think of the major gaps um, that comes to mind is that uh, we are um, not very used to looking past behavior. So what tends to occur when we look at either desirable or you know, undesirable behavior is that we either want them here or want them off. So perhaps looking past behavior to include also our own relationship needs. So we understand that youth, they are still going through an adolescent period, trying to get a sense of uh, the language to express themselves, to regulate themselves as well as a important psychological developmental milestone actually. So what we can do, is that we can guide and show them how by taking a lead. So if we feel a number of feelings as a result of certain distressing circumstances, we, it might be useful for us, just like we teach parents at the same time, to take the lead to speak about what they are afraid of, what they're angry about, what they're sad about. And this usually helps um, a lot of youth legitimize how they feel and as a result feel like they can share more of their parents a lot has been said on reducing stigmatization when it comes to mental health issues. How, in your mind, how are we faring with that? And what can be done to create enough safe spaces for, for individuals that are under, under strain? I think as an um, internally quite conservative nation, Ryan, I think um, sometimes it's really quite difficult for us to challenge what we are quite familiar with. Uh, in terms of our uh, belief systems, our familiarity regarding trying to address certain emotions in our context. So I, so I suppose the first part of call perhaps, as mentioned before, might be for us to just get the conversation going. Talk about what is something that might be quite difficult. And uh, from there, we can start to facilitate talking and uh, normalizing almost uh, how it feels like to talk about your feelings. Okay, and uh, if we can, as a community, start to open up kind of these conversations, automatically people might start to feel safe a bit more. But second point being, if we were to want to encourage youth and anybody else, right, teachers, students, parents, vendors, anyone around the whole ecosystem, uh, we want to encourage people to approach individuals that they feel safe first. Okay, and safety, a safe space would be encouraged uh, by actually being able to speak to someone, anyone that they feel safe with, right? And that can be defined as someone that will not judge them, that will not evaluate them or will not shame them for sharing particular uh, feelings or opinions. So many people have told me, right? Many youth has told me before that if I were to share something and it's not the popular opinion, uh, you know, I'm going to feel like people might say I'm too emotional, I'm too emo, I'm too drama. Uh, then I don't want to share anymore. Okay? And the same thing can happen in households and also at schools. Dr. E, a quick final question for you. Minister Chan spoke about building this communal safety net to perhaps incorporate you know, prevention both from you know, the government as well as within the community, that that's how far we have to go. But, but what do you think the success of that type of prevention, how far can it go? 
I think as a starting point, it's a great way to get everyone involved. You know, uh, being having been in public health for a vast number of years, I think we've started off wanting to uh, put in money into the National Mental Health Blueprint, which is great at uh, starting off this uh, national-wide kind of uh, way of wanting to help us get more uh, you know, informed uh, ment- mental health literacy as well as uh, destigmatization. So uh, following all these events, as well as the COVID pandemic, our, our mental health has been under fire pretty much. So I think there's no other better time for us to start this conversation since you know we can strike while the fire is quite hot, the iron is hot, and such that we can then encourage everybody to leg- legitimize that uh, you know whatever that we feel that's quite difficult, suffering, uh, can actually be made better by sharing a bit further. Yeah, it's it's a good start because we know that Dr. from the research e. that if we were to involve, uh, yeah, uh, if we were to involve. Um, community support, social support is a huge protective factor for mental health. Dr. E, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us this evening. Dr. Sean E from Psychology Practice.